Nelson Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. A personal tribute from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, close friend of Nelson Mandela. I first met Nelson Mandela, Madiba, in the 1950s when he adjudicated our college debating contest. We didn't meet again until the day he was released from prison in 1990. Madiba was never angry or complained about his 27 years in prison. He believed in peace and he taught us all an essential lesson about forgiveness when he invited his former prison guard to be a guest at his election as president of South Africa. He cared deeply about people and worked hard to set up charities and raise funds to build a better future for South Africa. Madiba believed children were a huge part of that future and contributed from his salary to set up the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. So it is wonderful that this book exists for children to share in the story of, of his inspiring life. One of my fondest memories of Madiba is how funny he was. I once made fun of the bright colourful shirts he wore and he replied that at least he didn't wear a dress in public like me. Our world is a better place for having had a Nelson Mandela. He has taught us so much about understanding and respecting each other for our differences. He was amazing and I feel blessed that he was my friend. Johannesburg, South Africa, March 2014. My name is Nelson Mandela. I live in South Africa, a beautiful country on the tip of Africa. Today, South Africa is a democracy. That means all adults vote to choose who they want to run the country. But it was not always like this. When I was born, South Africa was ruled by white people only. As I grew older, I began to see that this was not fair. I wanted to change this way of government so everyone had a say. My friends and I called this the struggle for freedom. The struggle lasted many years and I was one of the fighters. This is my story. Long, long ago, white Europeans crossed the seas to South Africa. They fought over the land and they also fought the tribes of people already living there, such as the Kosas, the Zulus and the Tswanas. Hundreds of years later, I was born into the Thembu tribe, one of the many tribes that made up the Kosa nation. I entered the world in the tiny village of Mviso in the beautiful Eastern Cape on 18th of July, 1918. My father was a Thembu chief, a leader of our people. He named me Rililaha, which in Kosa means troublemaker. Did he believe I would grow up to be a troublemaker? I don't think so. Nobody knew what lay ahead of me. When I was a young boy, we moved from Mviso to the nearby village of Quino, and I began herding our family sheep and goats. Those were happy days. My friends and I swam in the rivers, stole honey from beehives, and played stick fighting, a Kosa boy's favorite sport. When I turned seven, my father decided to send me to school. It was a mission school built by Europeans who had come to South Africa to spread Christianity. No one in my family had been to school before. I didn't have fancy clothes, but my father took a pair of his old trousers and cut them off at the knee. I used a piece of string as a belt, but the school wasn't fancy either. It had only one classroom. None of the pupils wore smart clothes, so I fitted right in. Our teacher gave us new names. Mine was Nelson. Nelson. At that time, the English ruled over our country. So our teacher thought we should all have English names. It sounded very strange at first, but I soon got used to it. My father taught me to be a brave Kosa boy. I wanted to grow up to be just like him. Sometimes I even rubbed ash into my hair to make it gray like his. I was learning at school, but I was learning at home as well. My mother told me stories from long ago, full of wise lessons about being kind to others. But after my ninth birthday, my life changed. My father grew ill and died. My mother took me to live with my father's friend, Chief John Intaba, in the nearby village of Makekaswini. Uncle Jongi was the acting king of the Tenbus, 
and he was a very important man. He had a motor car and lived in a big house called The Great Place. It was an exciting new experience for me. My mother still came to visit me and I was always happy to see her. Although I miss Gwenu, I loved my new life. Uncle Jongi's son, Justice, was a few years older than me and we became best friends. We rode horses and ploughed his father's fields together. We had a lot of fun. But life was not all about riding horses. When I was 16, Uncle Jongi sent me to Clarkbury boarding school. In those days, many boys and girls did not finish their schooling, but my uncle believed education was important. Three years later, I joined Justice at Healdtown, the biggest school for Africans in the country. This is where I completed my high school education. At the age of 21, I enrolled at Fort Hare, a university for black students in the Eastern Cape. Uncle Jongi brought me a new suit to wear. It was very different from the cut down trousers I had worn when I went to school. I felt very grown up. Young black people from all over the country came to study at Fort Hare. It was the first time I had met people from other tribes, such as Sutus, Zulus and Swanas. I made new friends, including a clever young student called Oliver Tambo. Although we didn't know it then, Oliver and I were to become very important in each other's lives. I worked hard at university, but I had fun too. I took up running, boxing and ballroom dancing. One night, my friends and I snuck out to the dance hall. We thought we were very daring until we met our teacher. But suddenly my student days were cut short. I was elected to sit on the student council, but only 25 students had voted. Most did not vote because the council could not change the thing that concerned them the most, the bad canteen food. I told the principal that I would not sit on the council without the student's support. He was very angry and threatened to expel me, but I wouldn't change my mind. I never went back to university. Was I living up to my name of troublemaker? Back at the great place, Uncle Jongi soon had other plans for me and Justice. He told us we were to be married and he had already picked a wife for each of us. We were shocked. We didn't want to get married and so we decided to run away to Johannesburg. Johannesburg was over 700 kilometres away. It was a place known to all Kosa people as Igoli, the place of gold. There we would find jobs and make new lives. It was an adventure and we set off full of hope and excitement for the future towards the twinkling lights of the big city. The city was bigger than we ever could have imagined. Everywhere we looked there were people, shops and cars. But those smart shops and expensive cars belonged to white people. Most black people were poor. I went to live in Alexandra Township, just outside the city, where the tiny houses had no electricity or running water and the roads were just dusty paths. Life was hard in Alexandra, but it became home to me. Justice stayed in Johannesburg for a while, but after a few years, Uncle Jongi died and Justice returned to the Eastern Cape to take over as chief. I met many new people, but one of my best friends was Walter Saisulu. Walter and his family lived in Orlando West, Soweto, a black township near Johannesburg. I looked up to Walter. Like me, he was from the Eastern Cape, but he had been in Johannesburg longer and knew a lot about the city's people and places. I spent a lot of time at the Saisulu's home. It was there I met Evelyn Mays, a young nurse and relative of the Saisulu's. We fell in love and got married. We had two sons and two daughters, but one daughter did not live long. Sadly, Evelyn and I soon parted, but I remained close to my sons, then Mikhail, Magato, and to my daughter, Makaziwe. At the Sashulus, I also met my old friend, Oliver Tambo again. We were both studying law, and in 1952, we set up the first black law firm in South Africa. But there was another way we could try to improve the lives of black people. Ever since white people had come to South Africa, they had ruled black people. My friend Walter was a member of the African National Congress, or ANC, which had been fighting for the freedom of black people to rule themselves. Oliver and I joined too, and at Walter's home we wondered how we could make the government take notice. In 1944 we formed the ANC Youth League, 
and planned to get thousands of young black people to join. We would protest peacefully by marching through the streets and demanding our freedom. We would not be ignored. In 1948, the government started passing laws that introduced apartheid, which divided black and white people into separate groups. White people lived in suburbs, while black people lived in townships. The government also built separate schools, churches and cinemas for black and for white people. There were even separate entrances to post offices and shops. All black people over 16 years of age had to carry a passport showing who we were and where we worked and lived. If we were found without our passport, we would be thrown into prison. Apartheid was a cruel system. It classified every person in South Africa according to race, for example, as black, coloured or white, and controlled the lives of those who were not white. It made me and my ANC comrades angry. In 1952, we led a protest called the Defiance Campaign, calling on black people to ignore the whites-only entrances in post offices, shops and trains. Over 250 people were arrested, but thousands joined in. The government didn't drop its apartheid laws, but the ANC now had many more members. We were getting stronger. The government banned me from attending ANC meetings or protesting against apartheid, but I went on working for the ANC in secret. It was not only black people who were against apartheid. Thousands of coloured Indian and white South Africans were against it too. In the early 1950s, many of these different groups joined together to form the Congress Alliance. Then, in 1955, the ANC and the other members of the Congress Alliance met in Clicktown, near Johannesburg, to draw up the Freedom Charter. The meeting was called the Congress of the People, and the Charter was a promise to fight for freedom and democracy for all South Africans. It began. We, the people of South Africa, declare for all our country and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. During that time, I fell in love again. Winnie Madikizela was a social worker and a member of the ANC. We got married in 1958 and had two daughters, Zanani and Zinzi. The government did not like the charter and arrested 156 Congress members, including Oliver, Walter and me. We were charged with planning to destroy the government. The trial lasted four long years, but in the end, we were found not guilty. In 1960, during our trial, a tragedy happened that shocked the world. In Sharpville, near Johannesburg, 5,000 people marched to a police station to protest against having to carry passports. They were not armed, yet still the police fired guns at them. 69 people were killed and 400 were injured. After Sharpville, the government banned the ANC and other organisations fighting for freedom. They did not want to share South Africa with black people. Our peaceful marches had not worked, but we were not giving up. We decided that the only way to get our freedom was to fight the government in the same way as they were fighting us, with guns. The ANC formed an army, which we called Unkanto Wisizwe, which in Kosa means the spear of the nation. I was sent abroad on a secret mission to ask other countries to help us fight apartheid. I also went to train as a soldier. In 1962, I returned to South Africa using a false passport and calling myself David Motsamai. I stayed in hiding for many months while the police searched everywhere for Nelson Mandela. Then one day in August, I was stopped in my car and arrested. I was sentenced to five years in prison for leaving the country illegally and for inciting workers to strike. Later, the police also arrested a group of my comrades, including my old friend, Walter Saizulin. Just nine months into my five-year sentence, I was told I would stand trial again. We were all charged with planning to overthrow the government. If we were found guilty, we could be sentenced to death. The trial began in October 1963, and in April 1964, I spoke in defence of us all. I told the court that the ANC was a peaceful organisation, but because the government had banned it, we had no peaceful way to protest. We had been imprisoned and even killed. This is why we had to take the fight back with guns. 
I said, I have cherished the ideal of a democracy in which all persons live together in harmony. It is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Eight of us were found guilty, but we were not sentenced to death. Instead, we were told we would spend the rest of our lives in prison. Life in prison? Would I ever see my wife, mother and children again? We were all taken to Robben Island, a prison off the coast of Cape Town. All except our comrade, Dennis Goldberg. Of the eight of us, he was the only white person and had to serve his sentence at a different prison. On Robben Island, my cell was so tiny that when I lay down on my sleeping mat, my feet and hands could touch opposite walls. I was given some thin blankets and a bucket for a toilet. This cell was to be my home. I tried to stay hopeful, but it wasn't easy. At first, we were allowed only two visitors a year and just two letters. Before we were given them, the letters were read by a prison guard who blacked out anything he thought that we shouldn't know about. Twice I received bad news from home. First, I was told my mother had died. Then my eldest son, then Mikhail, was killed in a car crash. When I got that news, I spent the whole day in my cell thinking about him and the rest of my family. It was one of the saddest days of my life. We were not allowed radios or newspapers. Weeks, months, years went by without us knowing what was happening in the world. One day, I saw that a warder had left his newspaper lying on a chair. It was too tempting. I grabbed the paper and began reading it. I was caught and locked in a room for three days with no food and only rice water to drink as a punishment. Slowly the years passed. Five years. Ten. Twenty. I no longer needed ash to make my hair grey. But outside the prison, the f fight for freedom went on. Even though the ANC was banned in South Africa, it continued outside the country. Oliver Tambo was living abroad and was now ANC president. Many governments around the world began to support us. In the 1980s, the ANC launched the Release Mandela campaign, asking people all over the world to put pressure on the South African government to release me and my fellow prisoners and to allow the ANC back in. Thousands of people signed the petition. Then in March 1982, Walter, a few other prisoners and I were moved to Polesmoor Prison near Cape Town. Was this a sign that things were beginning to change? Should I dare to hope our struggle for freedom was coming to an end? The government and I began secret talks about peace. In 1988, I was moved again to a prison called Victor Versta, but instead of a cell, I was given a cottage with a bedroom, a kitchen and a swimming pool. Back in October 1989, a number of my former Robin Island comrades had been released, including Walter Saisulu. Then on 2nd of February 1990, and two months after our meeting, President de Klerk stunned the world by announcing that I was to be released, along with all other political prisoners. He said it was time to talk about a new country. The government and I continued our talks, and in December 1989, I met with President de Klerk and we talked about a new South Africa things began to move very quickly. On the 11th of February 1990, I walked out of prison. 27 years of my life had passed since I was first taken to Robben Island, but the long walk to freedom was almost over. It was wonderful to hold my lovely wife, Winnie, in my arms, to see our four beautiful children, now grown up, and to hear my grandchildren laugh and call me granddad. Every day our Soweto home was filled with laughter and tears of joy as friends I hadn't seen in 27 years came to welcome me home. After our release, there was a lot of work to be done. The ANC and the government began to speak about peace and about a South Africa that would be shared by all its people, black and white. And on the 27th of April 1994, millions of people, young and old, streamed out of their homes to vote. It was the first time ever for black people, and they joined white people to vote for a new South Africa. It was a wonderful day. In May 1994, I became the first president of South Africa to be elected by all the people. I was 75 years old. My journey to freedom had ended. But a new journey had now begun, a journey to build a new South Africa. We must join hands and say we are one country, one nation, 
one people marching together into a future. A future in which people of all colours will learn to live in peace. Nelson Mandela was president of South Africa for five years. True to his promise to only serve one term, he stepped down as president in 1999, though he continued to work with leaders of other countries to try and make the world a better place for all. He also set up the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, the Nelson Mandela Foundation and the Mandela Rhodes Foundation. Every year the world celebrates Nelson Mandela International Day on 18th of July, his birthday. People mark the day by spending at least 67 minutes doing something for others. Each minute represents one of the 67 years that Nelson Mandela spent fighting for freedom and peace. Nelson Mandela passed away on the 5th of December 2013, aged 95, but his memory lives on as, his in as an inspiration to us all to believe in a world where nobody should suffer oppression or poverty.